Welcome back. Today is the 4th of September. This is CSE 220 Intro to Cybersecurity. Hope everyone had a great extended Labor Day weekend. Uh, on Friday, we reviewed the steps to follow for the solution. I have not posted that yet. However, uh, I've also noticed that over the weekend, um, these have these two assignments have not been completed by a number of students. And I just want everyone to be aware that there is a modest grace period for you to submit and to get stuff in, but it, it doesn't stretch on forever. As soon as I go ahead and score these things, if you don't have a submission loaded, the first score of record that you'll have in the system is a zero. And there's only so many times you can resubmit. So you don't want to burn your opportunities to submit. It's better to submit a partial a solution or a partial assignment and then to refine from there instead of not uh, submitting at all. Does anyone have any questions about what I just shared? No. Okay. I will be posting the 1.3 solution underneath the two assignments at the end of this session, but uh, if you have not yet completed 1.1 or 1.2, uh, you'll need to do that before you get to the solution. Um, the recording for how to complete the solution, I believe, is already loaded in uh, the M1 session. Yeah, the first solution is right here. So you can basically observe the last part of that recorded session, and it'll show and share which steps to follow and how to complete the work. Um, Today, what we wanted to do was to uh, begin our final review of module one content. And there were a couple of things I wanted to share right away. Can everyone see this screen? Yeah. Okay, so this is the view of a Google Pixel that's running an Android operating system. Do we have any Android users out there today? Yeah, I have Android. I also have a Pixel. <clears throat> okay, well, this update just pushed out, and basically, it's a pretty crit. It's a pretty serious one, and the reason this is significant is that when I went to the option to look for system updates, when the screen first appeared, it said you're up to date. It didn't say anything. And then when I click the button to manually check, this is what hit right away. And uh, essentially what you see here is the basic, the basic reason why the security update. So it's called a security. I want you to notice the wording. It's called a, a security update. And what it's doing is fixing critical bugs and improves the performance and stability. So if you read the detail, you would think, okay, it's gonna improve my stability and performance, but what kind of update is it? Hello? A security update. And I'm just calling that out because this is part of the game that uh, software publishers and hardware manufacturers uh, often play with their uh, customers. They don't want to incite a panic, but at this, by the same token, I want everyone to understand that if they put this out, it's important. I don't care what the wording says. If they went to the trouble to test it and to push it out there, there is something that needs to be fixed, okay? And everyone i mean everyone if you have an android android tablet android smartphone you should run not walk go to the option to check for updates and if you don't see it push right away it could be that samsung or other uh, manufacturers are taking an extra day or so to work on the kinks for their own version of this fix does everybody understand what i'm saying here Everybody understand what I just related? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, we have a few more folks who have checked in. Let me make sure we capture those and um, let's move on. Uh, one of the things that I saw over the weekend that was interesting um, was a TikTok video. And, you know, basically there's a, a person who wants to be helpful. And so she put it out there. Here's a computer hack only 1% of you know about. And I'm going to see if she actually fires off this interest properly or if she misses a step. So let's watch. It's a very short clip, but let's see what happens. Here's a computer hack that only 1% of you know about. Can you hear? Can everybody hear? Yes, I could hear. Yeah, we can hear. Go to your keyboard, hold down Windows while you click the letter R. You're going to type in MRT and then hit OK. OK. One of the things that I would advocate is an issue is that whenever you're using a security tool, whenever you want to fire off something that's important and uh, it's associated with your system security or stability, or it's a cybersecurity tool. If you just run it, see where it says show more details? Did you notice an option to run as administrator? No. No. No, that's true. No, and if you're... If you set up a system correctly, you're supposed to be work whenever you have a connection to the global internet, the World Wide Web, whenever you're connected to a public network, you want to be using an account that doesn't have administrative privileges. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But essentially, it should whenever you try to execute something, it should ask, okay, can you give me a password? And the fact that this doesn't have the option in the first place is an issue. Now, this is a very useful tool. The Microsoft Windows Malicious Software Removal Tool, right, WRT. Um, one of the things you can do to run this as an administrator or any security tool, right, is to uh, find the executable and then right click and run as admin. Um, unless, of course, it's, uh, it's a, it's a different uh, kind of program package. Again, uh, we'll get into the weeds on that a little more. Uh, but essentially what this does is it kicks off a utility and then the user has to restart the system and then it scans for the presence of malware when the operating system is offline. It hasn't been loaded yet. And, and so this is... An important step, this is something that you should do uh, when there are updates. And when you see in Windows updates that there is an update for the malicious removal tool. So if you go in here and then you check for updates, and one of the things in the list mentions malicious removal tool, that's one thing you should probably take the time uh, to operate because, again, if they're putting it out there, they're not just putting something out there for no good reason. Does that make sense? Does that pass everybody's smell test? Yes. Okay, good. Glad to hear it. Um, let's talk about our basic uh, concepts for cybersecurity. I'd like to go ahead and just emphasize again that the Intro to Cybersecurity course covers a broad landscape of topics, concepts, and methods, right? Cybersecurity, the landscape for cybersecurity is huge. And your textbook basically uh, covers some history and some design controls, right? So there is a paradox and it's, I'd, I'd call it the uh, friendly user paradox. So people who are designing systems and hardware and software, they have to choose between 
security and ease of use and features. It's called the design triangle. Uh, so this is something we'll get into um, at a later time when we start talking about software security in particular. Um, if you, to, to summarize, if you make something easy to use for the average person, then it's not very secure. If it's highly secure and there are lots of extra measures, then it's not likely to be easy to use, right? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. And how many difficult to use products do you think would sell very well in the marketplace? Not very. Not very many. That's right. And so this is something that's been around a long time. This paradox is actually something that riddles the history. It just peppers the entire history of information security, right? And we'll talk about the, uh, the rings of security and the history of the mainframe and all that kind of stuff. But basically part of the course is to kind of take you on a journey through the past so you can understand why we are where we are today, okay? Of course, uh, no general course in information security would be complete without a whole slew of definitions for a lot of technical concepts, right? And then, did everybody see this one right here? CIA. Mm-hmm, CIA. That's something we in introduced quite a while ago. In fact, um, if you look, we we touched on we touched on some cybersecurity basics on the 26th of August, and then we hit the pause button and we got into some uh, hands-on stuff with assignments and the solution and getting your tech ready, prepping your tech for a Kali virtual machine, and so on. Right. So, so we kind of hit the pause button, but let's go back to CIA. Oop. Yeah, let's go back to CIA. What does what do the letters CIA stand for? Anyone? Confidence, integrity, availability. That's correct. Confidentiality, right? So it's a when you say confidence, I'm sure that's what you meant. Confidentiality, that means it's a secret. Integrity, that means it hasn't changed. So the data has integrity, meaning nobody's altered it. They haven't modified your medical information. They haven't modified your date of birth. They haven't modified the prescriptions that you're taking. They haven't modified your bank account. Hello. Right. So integrity is right up there with confidentiality. And then availability, right? It's no good if you can't use it, if you're locked out, if you're denied the service or resource. If you've been reading ahead in the study guide, like you were asked to do, there's another acronym, AAA or AAA. Does anyone know what that one is? We haven't covered that one in class. We did not, we did not go into depth on that one, but those you're going to see those over and over and over again in all of the cybersecurity courses. Does anyone authenticate their access? Uh, you mean like the uh, like the two-factor auth authentication thing? Yes. Yeah, okay. the, for UVI, for my Yahoo email. Yes. Yeah. The letter that uh, uh, the word authentication starts with is A, right? And uh, access control, right? And then accountability or auditing. Now I'm just, that's just broad brush and in some venues, the AAA and the CIA, the the A's mean something a little different, especially if you're British or, uh, but in any case, uh, for our intent and purposes, that's what we're talking about. Now, once you get finished with the broad overview and you take a deeper dive, right? The uh, We keep talking about risk and how that's, tied, joined to the hip with something called exposure. And exploits are devised, exploits are devised to take advantage of a given exposure. 
And oftentimes, uh, people will use the word vulnerability, and and they'll they'll mix all these terms up. And what we want you to do is to understand the risk is the probability that a given exposure, right, would have an exploit, and then, in addition, a threat that knows how to use the exploit would be active in the environment. So let's repeat that again. Um, exposure, right? That's pretty obvious. Uh, there's a gap in the security, in the measures. There, There is something that's supposed to be locked down that isn't. That's and it could be that uh, something is not confidential, right? Or the integrity isn't there, so the stuff can be changed, right? The exposure could have all manner of different facets, right? Something could be exposed so that it's very easily taken out of commission. So the availability piece is what kicks in. Now, ex exploits are methods devised to literally exploit or, you know, literally exploit. That's a strategy for attack. Now that doesn't mean you're under attack. It means this is how someone would attack. So an exposure is gonna present an opportunity. The exploit is the method used to tap into that exposure, right? A threat has to know how to use the exploit. A threat has to be active in the environment. And then a threat has to make a decision to attack using that strategy or exploit. And when we talk about risk, risk is all of that together. What's the likelihood that all of those pieces are there at the same time in the same place, right? The knowledge and ability, the willingness to do something, all of that. Now, do we have any questions about those basic definitions? In general, for many years, the focus for information security was to play defense. Now, when I say play defense, I mean, there would be measures for hardware, for software, for the network, for systems, for uh, the environment, the technology environment, right? Defense in depth. Can everybody see this DID down here? It's uh, handwritten, but it's DID. Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, so DID, right, would, would be defense in depth. And that means that you have control measures. You have control measures at the hardware level, at the software level, across the network. You know, when a system boots up, right, you might have a firewall at the edge of the network or a spam filter. There's all of these different layers of defenses. You could have, how many of you have guest Wi-Fi set up in your home on your Wi-Fi router? Anybody? No? No guest Wi-Fi? I do. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so if you have the guest Wi-Fi set up, on your Wi-Fi router, then somebody who's who doesn't belong in your home, who's using the guest Wi-Fi, is they're operating on a completely different network. And because they're in a completely different network, they don't, their network traffic doesn't mix at all with your Wi-Fi traffic. We would call that a, a defense in depth strategy for the network, right? You have more than one network. You have, you say, uh, hey, for people we trust, here's our home network. For people who are visiting, it's our guest network. And that simple decision creates a layer, a depth of defense, defense and depth, right? And of course, you have security measures that protect the data itself. So in general, you have data at rest and data in motion. And uh, you have to consider securing that data, no matter the state of that data, whether it's uh, 
whether it's in motion or it's at rest. Now, there are other aspects of information security that uh, contribute to the overall uh, security and stability of a computing environment, or they erode or degrade that kind of thing. So in information security and cybersecurity, there are human elements, organizational elements. Uh, when we say policies and procedures, P and P, we're talking a policy is the local written standard. It's like the local law and it operates legally as if it were law. It's just not a law that the VIPD would enforce, but if you have a written policy and a procedure and it's established and it's a standard that people know about and they're trained to follow and it's not followed, then you have the basis for punitive measures, for disciplinary actions, right? And, and that kind of goes, I mean, when you think about how laws work, if we break the law, there's usually consequences. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? Most people don't think of policies and procedures as the law. Most people don't, in your student handbook, did you know that there's an acceptable use policy for when you're connected to the campus technology, when you're using the campus Bucks Wi-Fi, when you're using the campus computer labs? Those are the formal written expectations, the formal written standards, right? And there are, there are organizations that don't have those in the first place. Boo. But then there's organizations that have them. They just don't enforce them. Boo. That gives everybody a false sense of security. That's actually more lethal. And when you think about it, that reflects a gross incompetence or negligence or both on the part of this component right here. What am I talking about here? Leadership. Leadership, right? Now, would you say that a manager is the same as a leader? I would say so. They're similar. And organizational effectiveness experts, right? So when you talk about efficiency experts and organizational effectiveness, right? they would tell you that they're similar managers tend to be more official and they have proper authorization because of their position but quite often in organizations have you ever met somebody that technically they don't have the rank of oh but they're running the show the tail is wagging the dog have you ever seen a case and it may not be a business, it could be at home, right? You could have like a home environment where the, the child is actually calling all the shots, right? And the parents are just in a terrible place. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? Yes, no, maybe. It's awfully quiet. Is it possible that cybersecurity intersects cybersecurity means that stuff like this is take it's a, there's an account of it right there's an intentional account of okay what do we have for the management picture in an organization now who are the actual leaders who are the spark plugs who are the instigators who are the folks that make things happen regardless of their official title as a manager, right? Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, we understand. If you ever want to see how this works, watch what happens when the payroll clerk decides they're not doing the paychecks. That's called power as opposed to authority. And that's a dynamic of leadership. True leaders understand the difference between proper authority and the ability to effectively wield that or translate that into action. 
And there are people who don't have a lot of official authority, but man, can they, do they wield power, right? And influence. And so they may be leaders, even though they're not officially a manager. And those are the folks that you need to be aware of in the human element, right? Because, well, to err is human. We have users and then we have, oh my gosh, do we have this group right here. Now, let me tell you about the double-edged sword that technology professionals present in most organizations. And I'm gonna take a little side trip to a YouTube video that I find pretty hilarious, right? And um, I'm gonna see if I can access this pretty quickly here. So, is anyone familiar with Jackie Chan? Of course. Okay, you know Jackie Chan. Oh, I didn't had happy fingers here. And um, okay, so this is a skit that was on Saturday Night Live. Do we have any Saturday Night Live fans here? Can everybody hear this and see this? I don't know if there's if they're can't talking hear. right now, but I can't hear it. Yeah, I called about half hour ago. Told me to go soak my head. I don't like that guy. Well, I tried to run that Norton program to fix it, but it didn't work. And I don't know. That's because Norton Utilities can only detect a virus. It can't repair your hard drive after you download an infected program, Patch Adams. <laughs> so, believe it or not, there is a dynamic here, and it's not a happy one. I managed a computer support department, an information technology department, at a... At a a pretty decent campus. We had five locations. We had a thousand people we served in five locations. All right. And there was um, a culture among the technology people on the help desk in terms of how everybody knows what customer service is, right? Customer service. Everybody understands oh, yeah. customer service, right? And so what I'm going to do here is open up, uh, we need, we need uh, here, okay? So in this draft, I'm going to add a note about this, and it's, it's hugely important, okay? And I'm going to refer to this occasionally. Has anyone ever heard of the term leet speak? It's leet speak. Or better yet, let's do it this way. So lead speak is when you're substituting numbers for letters, right? To spell a word. And this is kind of a techie thing, a nerdy thing, right? A hacker thing. Everybody with me? Yeah. Okay. So what would you think of somebody in terms of their customer service skills if they called a help desk, the technology folks, and they had a simple question and within earshot of the user, uh, they turned around and they said, oh, we've got another 10 ID 10 T error. Now that's code for what? What does that spell? What does that word spell? <laughs> definitely spells the idiot. It definitely spells idiot. Okay, now what's the problem here? Let's go back to this. If you, oh, I'm sorry, we'll get to that in just a minute. If you have a technology staff and there's 
an undercurrent, a subculture where they're the gifted people. They're the ones that know how to fix printers. When people are desperate, right? When, when they have a meeting and they have to print, when they have a laptop that won't show on the screen, right? You remember what I was saying about power in an organization? Right? So here's the issue. What do you think is going to happen if a user witnesses a problem with their system and the IT staff, the tech support people at the health desk, they're not so helpful. They're actually very critical. What are the odds that the user is going to like willingly report, hey, my screen is doing something funny? What do you think? They probably just won't report it. <laughs> they probably just won't report it. And that's huge, right? Because your users are kind of like the first line of defense. And if you're talking about elements of solid information security, oh, ladies and gentlemen, your users are your strongest tool, your greatest resource, because if you have them in a good place, as an information, as a cybersecurity professional, when something goes sideways, if they trust you, they will share, hey, something's off. And you'll get an early read on a problem before it gets out of control, before it ruins everything. But if you're like Nick Burns, the computer guy, and the only thing he likes to do is talk about, yeah, oh, it's a layer eight problem. There are seven layers of networking. How many people knew this? Seven layers of networking. Does that ring a bell? Yes, no, maybe? I think I've briefly heard about it, but I've definitely forgotten like all of it. It's the human. Layer eight is the human. And that's usually not a positive connotation, right? When people talk about a layer eight problem, okay? They're talking about a human problem. And it's their technical way of saying, oh, yeah, I know why this internet isn't working. It's because they don't know what the hell they're doing, right? So they talk about it's a layer eight problem or it's a it's an ID10T error. And what I would encourage you to understand up front is that if you're a cybersecurity professional and if you go, if you walk into an environment, right, where this is happening here, where the IT staff is like Nick Burns, you, you have to jump all over that. And here's the problem. Guess who hires the cybersecurity person in most organizations? Do you think it's the users or do you think it's the tech staff that have a problem? Half the time, it's the tech staff. It's the tech management or it's the tech leadership, right? And if they're not, if they don't have a rein on, on that kind of toxic, toxic, degrading behavior, first of all, it's unprofessional. Okay. And I just want to come out and say that. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell you. I used to catch people on my help desk doing that kind of stuff. And the first thing that would happen is swift, sudden, irrevocable disciplinary action and a warning that they were not going to be long for this world on our help desk, on my campus, in, in my shop, because I didn't want to have users feeling stupid, right? I don't want them hiding in the shadows because some geek who knows some, but he knows he's got some specialized knowledge, right? It's their way of, it's their way of lording themselves over someone else, right? It's a, it's a terribly, difficult thing and it's a dynamic in a lot of organizations you're not going to read much about that in our textbook but it's there and it's going to be in the study guide addendum because in the 25 years i've worked cybersecurity, every year there's something about that that bites the organization right on the backside and it's not pleasant at all right it has to do with the human element, and it's the thing that you don't expect, people not doing what you would expect them to do. Courtesy, confidentiality, discretion, right? Things people value. That's something the IT staff, if they ever catch a whiff 
of how powerful the proper countenance with the end users can be. Oh my gosh. They, they will grow in wisdom, knowledge, and stature. They will achieve leadership status in an organization, even if all they are is a lowly tech. And, and that's important to understand, right? Um, what is this right here? I know it's kind of scribbled. Should I increase the size of that? Let me increase the size of that. Uh, it's supposed to be an S with a line through it. What am I? What is that a symbol for? Looks like a dollar sign. A dollar sign is correct. So one of the other aspects of cybersecurity is effective cybersecurity doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but there is a cost and you do have to plan for it. And there has to be a budget. And if you're in an organization where they just don't do anything until it's broke, Run screaming from the room with your hands flailing in the air and don't look back. Okay? Because those are dangerous leaders and managers who don't understand if, if, you, if it's not important enough to commit some resource, real tangible resource. We know what I'm talking about. A, a good firewall. A proper firewall. A proper network switch which costs all of $20 more, but sometimes people are so penny wise and pound foolish, it's nuts. And that's another dynamic of the organization and the people. And there we're talking about like a social aspect where everybody's trying to work together to lower costs and it's driven from the top down. And it's more of a social thing than an individual thing, but everybody knows they have to do their part to lower costs. So they don't really think about you know, oh, well, yeah, well, maybe, well, do we spend money on a new firewall or or do we have enough for decent beer and uh, meat for the grill at the company picnic, right? And those are, those are practical nuts and bolts decisions, but it gets back to management and leadership again, right? They're making decisions. And sometimes the money people need to understand the risk now, if you take that same money person that wants to save the money and they don't want to spend it, and they think that spending $200 for a proper firewall is too much, then you tell them, and this is where cybersecurity experts come in, there's a whole way of translating risk into money. That's what risk management does. In practical terms, risk management is misunderstood as a discipline within the world of cybersecurity, but it is your friend and your most powerful tool when you're dealing with leadership and you have administrative people and financial people who don't really get cyber. They're not technical people. They're tired of being made fun of. They don't want to look stupid because they're, they're managers, they're leaders, right? How many managers and leaders want to look stupid in front of the people they manage and supervise? No, nobody does, right? So they're very guarded. Is that not human behavior? I mean, is that not just something that's, I mean, when, on the face of it, I'm talking about it. It's something that, something that should just make sense, right? But let's say you put in writing, hey, you save 200 bucks, you're going to lose $10,000 when your data is compromised. You have to report it and there's a fine. Oh yeah. Oh, and did I mention there's a jail sentence that comes with that too? $5,000 for every occurrence and six months in jail. So you're risking $5,000. And here's the thing. As a cybersecurity expert, I'm going to tell you, there is an exposure. There's a well-crafted exploit that's well-known. It's out on the internet. All you have to do is Google it or ask chat GPT about it. And it just spills out on the screen. Oh, and you have threats in your environment and they're active and they're doing things. So... I'm going to assert as a cybersecurity professional that the risk of this is at least once per year. At least once a year, you're going to have a problem with this. So now you ask yourself, do you want to spend $200 on a device that's going to protect you? And that device will last three years. Or 
do you want to ignore the risk management statement and advisory I just put out where I guarantee, I guarantee that you're going to get hacked. You're going to lose $5,000 and somebody's going to jail for six months. Hello. Put another way, cybersecurity professionals have to have integrity as well as backbone. Backbone. Integrity is no good without backbone, okay? Now, I'm going to splash this on the screen real quick. This is just a hand drawing of uh, some objects, right? And uh, essentially what you have is a Wi-Fi router right here. So, so this is a, a conceptual map of all the functions that a Wi-Fi router is capable of providing to a home network. You have an inside home network over here. Does everybody see that? The inside network. And then you have the outside internet over here, right? And then in between, if you look at a Wi-Fi router, it has the router piece. On the back side, it has a switch. There's also Wi-Fi radio. There's a firewall, right? And then there's something called a DMZ where you can put stuff that you want to have access to, but you don't want that exposing everybody else in here. What am I talking about? Do, do we have any gaming console folk in our class by any chance? Do any of you own a gaming console? Of course. Uh, of course. And do you ever use that gaming console to like collaborate uh, with team gaming routines over the internet? Yep, all the time. All the time. All the time. And what happens if it's buried inside your home network and your favorite sibling or your parent or somebody, they get on there and they start streaming their high def stuff and the performance of your game starts to really suck. Has anyone ever experienced that? I, I used to. You used to. Okay. Did you know that your Wi-Fi router has a nice little feature called a DMZ? And what it allows you to do is to park your game console right out here near the internet where it gets all of the glorious bandwidth it needs. But the benefit is, is that nobody inside is the wiser and they're not affected. In real terms, they're not affected. And more importantly, all that gaming stuff that could go sideways, it doesn't expose them because if it goes sideways it happens out here and not in here does that make sense kind of sort of makes sense okay now we'll get into virtual lands vlans we'll get into backups all that kind of stuff later what i wanted to do was to just share some concept maps with you so that we could sort of take in more of the landscape uh, more efficiently and more quickly. And um, when we return on Friday, what we're going to do is walk through, uh, we're gonna provide support for any of you that are having any difficulty completing the solution. So as soon as we sign off here, I'm gonna post the solution for module one. And we need you to try to have that complete by Friday. And what we'd like to do is take up the real fun stuff. And if you complete your solution, have I got a class for you on Friday? Because you'll take the results of your solution, and we'll turn them sideways, and the folks on your home network are going to find out what, what a hero you are in short order, because... A lot of times there's exposures out there that nobody even knows are there. And what you want to do is understand how they present and what to do about it in short order. Put another way, we don't want you to be students of cybersecurity learning the basics. Um, but you get hacked 10 ways to Sunday in your own house. That's just wrong, in my opinion. Stay tuned. Friday is when we roll up our sleeves and dive in. We'll see you there.